The goal of sample preparation is to make high-quality libraries. We accomplish this by having a robust process that is highly reproducible and automated. We also have other tools in place, such as process maps, work instructions, and process change emails that help us meet this goal. Process maps are high-level charts that list the steps involved in each process. If a technician requires more detail, they refer to work instructions. Furthermore, we at the Broad are constantly making improvements to our protocols, and in order to maintain process control, we need to effectively communicate these changes. We do so by sending emails informing technicians about the improvements and updating the process maps and work instructions in a timely manner. Finally, our tracking sheets act as reports that provide us a valuable tool for troubleshooting. The first page of the tracking sheet is color-coded according to the library type and lists the samples along with the tracking numbers assigned to them in each stage of the process. At the bottom of the page, the parameters required by these samples, shearing protocol, gel conditions, and PCR conditions, are highlighted in an easy-to-reference format. We record the lot numbers and instrument identification of all the reagents and machines used during the library construction. This is important for troubleshooting reagent problems or mechanical failures. We also use the tracking sheets to document the results of the QC's pre- and post-enrichment, the shearing profiles, gel images both before and after the cut, picogreen quantitation results, and qPCR data. By listing all the data pertinent to a library in one easy-to-reference sheet, we save time during troubleshooting. One place the Broad protocol deviates from the Illumina protocol is in shearing. The standard Illumina protocol suggests shearing with nebulization. We use the Covaris E210 for a couple of reasons. First, the Covaris can shear up to 96 samples in a set. Second, the 96 well format integrates easily with our automation. We can go straight from our sample tubes into the Covaris plate using the Bravo to do an automated transfer and directly back out of the Covaris tubes again using the Bravo, reducing the chance of sample swaps or contamination. Further, Covaris provides flexibility for shearing different size distributions. We can manipulate a number of settings, such as duty cycle, intensity, time and cycles per burst, to get a different size distribution for various applications. We've done a full factorial experiment to understand the effects of each parameter on size distribution. If we have a specialty experiment, we consult the factorial to determine the parameters we should use to obtain the specified shearing profile. It is important to control for other factors, such as bath temperature, water level, oxygen content, the tube type, and tube holder, because these variables can also affect the final shearing profile. We use the Agilent Bioanalyzer as a QC step after shearing and again after enrichment. We track all the QC information so we can troubleshoot any downstream problems. Here we'll show a combination of good phenotypes and bad phenotypes, in other words, what we'd expect from shearing and enrichment, as well as what we would not expect. The first thing we'll show you is our typical 500 base pair shear. For our high diversity libraries, we'll need large fragment sizes, so we shear to 500 base pair. Here you can see that although our goal is 500 base pair, it is really hard to shear the entire sample into this size range. The typical 500 base pair shear exhibits a wide distribution centered between 300 and 700 base pair. Within this set, all of the samples were sheared to the acceptable size range and passed the QC step. We have three validated shearing protocols, 500 base pair, 200 base pair, and 150 base pair. The 200 base pair shear is centered on 200, and you can see that at this fragment size we see a much tighter distribution, but there is still tailing on both ends. The 150 base pair shear has the tightest distribution. This tight shearing coupled with spry cleanups is how we've been able to eliminate gels from many of our processes, such as hybrid selection and standard library construction. Different applications require different QC sample profiles, in this example, we were making a high-diversity library with 16 PCR reactions and a very tight cut. Notice that the peak is tight and tall. If we take two cuts from the sample, we would expect each sample to look like this. We use this QC step to identify process failures, start rework of those samples right away, and prevent low-quality samples from getting onto the sequencer. Here's a great example of why tracking our QC details can be very helpful and how we can use that QC data in conjunction with our sequencing results 
to have a clear picture of exactly what happened in the process. It's also a good example of how we can learn the consequences of proceeding with a sample that fails our QC. We sequenced a library that produced low quality data, even though the rest of the libraries prepared alongside it produced excellent results. We were able to go back to our tracking sheets and figure out what happened. Here, if you look at the whole set of libraries, everything looks great in the shearing profile. We have tall peaks and there is plenty of starting material. Next, we'd look at the post enrichment profile and we'd expect to see peaks between 200 and 300 base pair. S9543 is the library that produced poor sequencing results. It's the black line here. You can see that it shows a tight peak at 119 base pair, but no peak between 200 and 300 base pair. This indicates the presence of adapter dimer, but no enrichment of the targeted size range. As we discuss in the data module, we typically expect the sequencing intensity plots to show an equal distribution of all four bases at each cycle. Library S9543 shows overrepresentation of a different base at each cycle, clearly readable as adapter sequence. Catching an adapter dimer problem at the library QC step ensures that we don't waste our resources on sequencing adapter clusters, especially since adapter dimers typically outcompete library fragments on the flow cell. Preventing poor quality libraries from getting onto the sequencer saves huge amounts of time and money. Tracking these QC details and having these data to refer back to helps us identify failure modes and prevent their recurrence. The Agilent Bioanalyzer has been extremely useful in our exploration of the Covaris and in trying to optimize our shearing conditions. Throughout the years, we've tried a number of methods for shearing, and the Agilent has helped us visualize the results for each experiment. This poster reinforces the need for validation before you implement any shearing conditions or any new protocol. Here we're focusing on the need for validation. You can see that all of these samples were sheared using the same Covaris protocol, but altering the tube material, type of tube holder, and starting DNA input amounts had an impact on the results. Before using a new protocol or implementing any changes, you really need to thoroughly understand the consequences. In this section, we focus on how even a shearing tube holder, which seems inconsequential, can make a huge difference in how the sample shears. When we tried a new tube holder with a screw-on cap, the pressure built up in our tubes heating up the DNA and causing it to shear down to small oligos. In this image, we show that even though the bath water level seems insignificant, it must be carefully controlled. If we set the water level too high, then the water can flood the tubes, especially if we're using snap caps instead of screw caps. Sample can seep out of the tubes and water can seep in, causing cross-contamination and sample loss. Maintaining the proper bath level is critical. This image helps show the importance of validating any changes to the protocol. We wanted to switch to using a 50 microliter volume instead of a 100 microliter to integrate with SPRY and automation protocols, which we go over in another module. We found that shearing results are volume dependent. We tested 50 microliter using the standard programmed settings used for 100 microliter shears, and what we saw was that even though most of the samples sheared to the size we wanted, we ended up with quite a bit of DNA that didn't completely shear, producing tailing. We hypothesized that during the shearing process, some of the material was splashing up onto the sides of the tubes and not actually being sheared in the process. In response, we reduced the intensity, duty cycle, and cycles per burst, and extended the shearing time. This gentler program produced the size range we wanted for the 50 microliter samples. In this image, we focus on how using the Agilent QC allows us to salvage samples that didn't shear well. When a sample's shearing profile shows that the shearing was insufficient and the size range is too large, it's possible to shear it further. Some of the material from the previous image was placed back in the Covaris and re-sheared. While reshearing doesn't always work perfectly, it does allow us to proceed with more correctly sized material than we would otherwise have had. This is especially helpful if there's no more unsheared sample remaining. 